So I'm David Weinstock. I'm a uh, assistant professor and academic who works at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center in Boston. And my, uh, my laboratory interest is in the uh, genetics and targeting of blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. And my clinical expertise is in treatment of mostly adults with those diseases uh, and the use of bone marrow transplantation. So I have kind of a long, there's a long journey to get to that point. Uh, I graduated from the college in 93 and then went on to medical school through 97 and then did internship to 98, residency to 2000, clinical oncology fellowship to 2001, clinical ID fellowship, infectious disease fellowship to 2002, then went into the lab for five and a half years and I got my first job in 2008, so 15 years after leaving the college um, as an assistant professor. Uh, very long journey that I loved every step of and I think one of the lessons I think you're going to hear repeatedly from the panelists is that it's about the journey. It's about maintaining a steep learning curve and, and enjoying that. Um, and then, you know, with those skills, with the ability to go to a patient, ask a question, take samples, go back to the laboratory, study basic chemistry, biology, biochemistry, use animal models, do structural modeling, and so on, we were, within a very short period of time, able to identify uh, a new gene in leukemia and then develop targeted therapies, and those are now in clinical trials, all within just a couple of years of work. And so I look at it as a very long process to get there, to do this sort of hyper-academic type of career, but now, you know, I'm 38 years old. I got another 35 years of doing this uh, where we can ask new questions every day and really make a big difference in the lives of uh, people with these diseases. So that's enough about me. I'll pass it on. Why don't we start at this end and we can okay. each work our way down. Uh, my name is Sean Curry. I graduated from, Good one. Uh, I believe it's on, right? Um, graduated in 93, uh, degree in psychology, went immediately on to chiropractic school. I'm a chiropractic uh, physician down here in the city. Um, was complete, while I was in the school, all the way up until my second year, was dedicated to going to Pritzker. Um, had a life change happen with regards to my mom, in regards to where her chiropractor actually diagnosed uh, lupus that had been missed for five years with her medical doctors. And so I started doing a little bit more research on chiropractic care and what it did, so it kind of pushed me more towards the typical University of Chicago, is like not a lot of people are doing this, and I'm going to have a lot of, you know, fight to be able to kind of put out what I believe in and what I like to do for medicine. And uh, it's rewarding for the fact where being a, a, you know, having a person on a table and being able to have that person come in stumbling <coughs> or wheeled in a wheelchair or in more recent, a little child who couldn't feel how their bowels were moving and be able to do a single adjustment and see that immediate change in the way the body starts to heal itself. That's where I started kind of rewarding, get the reward where being able to teach people how their body can heal and then at the same time be able to refer them out to medical practices when they're a little bit past what chiropractic is able to do. So the big thing about doing research and knowing you know, what I can help and what I can't help so that person on that first day knows that they're either in the right office or they're getting the right path is one of the big things that pushes me towards healthcare and what I want to do on a day-by-day -day basis. My name is Julie Schrieffer. I'm a third year obstetrics and gynecology resident um, through Midwestern University here in Chicago. Um, I graduated in 2004. Um, I actually graduated with Mark all the way down at the end, we graduated the same year. Um, I took a year off um, as I was a little overwhelmed with the application process, as some of you might get to. Um, worked in a law firm and worked at the zoo and then um, started my career in um, osteopathic medicine. I'm just going to take one or two quick minutes and explain what that is because a lot of you, I'm sure, have not heard of that um, as an option for going into the medical field. Um, osteopathic medicine is an alternative to allopathic medicine, or the MDs that you guys hear about and mostly see. It, um, we are boarded in every subspecialty um, that MDs are boarded in, uh, like obstetrics and gynecology, like I do, to peds neurology, anything like that. Um, the practice is very similar. Of medicine, but the education is a little bit different, and it's the education that really drew me to osteopathic medicine. So um, there are four tenets that um, we hold on to. The first is that the the person is made of a mind, body, and spirit. 
The second is that um, the body has the natural ability to heal itself. And the third is that the structure and the function of the body are connected. So in practice, you might not see things that are very different. However, in the way we interview patients, the way we um, pay attention to their social circumstances, their religious circumstances, things like that, should, I'm not saying that they always do, but should be a little bit different. And then we learn um, osteopath osteopathic manipulations um, almost similar to the way that chiropractors do work. I think that's the, the, the way that most people would look at it, even though the theory behind it is a little bit different, believing that if you move the structure of the body, that the, the body will um, be able to fix itself a little bit better. At the same time, though, we have full prescribing privileges. Um, we're surgeons, we're in the OR. Uh, I go, I'm an osteopath, but I work side by side with the residents from UIC and St. Francis and things like that in the city. And most uh, patients don't know the difference between us. So it's a little bit of a different process to get to the um, same place as a lot of MDs get to. Okay. Did this work? Hi. Oh. Hi. Uh, my name is Ariel Mir, and I am the assistant director of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. I know that's a mouthful. I work in Washington, D.C., and um, unlike, unlike the other folks here on the panel, um, I don't provide health care on a day-to-day -day basis, but... Um, very deeply, I do impact the healthcare system that we have in this country. And I just want to tell a little bit of a story that crystallized for me in my head why it is I want to do what I do as opposed to what some of the other folks here do. Um, so my dad is a physician. He's an infectious disease doctor, and he runs an HIV clinic at the VA hospital in Brooklyn. And I had done a project in graduate school about needle exchange programs, like for IV drug users. Um, and they're, it, you know, they're pretty controversial and you, know, you can't use federal funding for them. And I had done this project about them and I asked my dad, well, like, well, what do you do when you see patients who you know are IV drug users, who you know probably don't have access to clean needles out in the world, you know, how, how do you feel about it? And he said, well, I know that those people need clean syringes and so I give them, you know, extra syringes for their diabetes and I make sure they have what they need. And that made me feel good that my dad is a good doctor and he's looking out for his patients and what's happening to them out in the world. But I know that not everybody has my dad has my dad as their doctor. And you know, I feel very passionately that there are um, levers that we can turn in the public policy process that can make it easier for everyone to get access to what they need, be it clean needles or low-cost birth control or things like that. So when I graduated from the college in 2002, I moved to Washington and I worked for a small advocacy organization that focused on women's health. And our big achievement was bringing the morning after pill over the counter. So we helped to influence the FDA approval process there. I went on to graduate school to get a degree in public affairs um, where I did more learning in statistics and economics and politics and psychology. Um, a program at Princeton that trains people to be to be public servants, and then I went on to work at the Medicare program, so administering um, the biggest health insurance program in our country, and I did that for a few years. And now I work at this commission that advises Congress about the Medicare program. So, as you probably know from your own experience, if not your intellectual experience, that health insurance is really complicated. Um, it's really complicated and controversial for lawmakers to deal with it, and so they created a commission, a nonpartisan independent commission, to give them advice about it. So um, what I will say, the last thing I'll say before turning it over to Mark, is that um, you don't have to shirk a medical career to do what I do. Um, I decided to go more of a public policy route, and I was, I studied French literature and went abroad, and I was a political science major, but um, it takes a lot of different people to make the healthcare system work, um, and uh, we're going to need a lot more people to help it work better. And you need people like me who are more generalists, but you also need physicians who can talk about, um, you know, talk about with confidence and with, um, you know, with experience about what good healthcare is, helping big payers like the Medicare program. Uh, decide how to you know steer its policy so that it's getting you know the best use of your taxpayer dollar for Medicare and serving Medicare beneficiaries well. Okay, is this working? Yes, no, yes. Okay, so my name's Mark. Um, I actually graduated from University of Chicago in 2004, as kind of previously mentioned, 
I actually stayed on at the University of Chicago to enter into um, a particular MD-PhD program called the MSTP, the Medical Scientist Training Program. It's a program where you sign on uh, at, you know, right out of college or whenever you, you enter into the program, but to do both a PhD and an MD. And the way it usually works is you do about one to two years of medical school. Now it's currently you do one year of medical school. You take a break from the medical school, you do an entire PhD in whatever field you want, and then you come back and finish up medical school. And so in the end, you have both degrees. People usually use this degree to do a lot of things. I'm actually currently about a few months away from finishing my medical degree, so I'm just getting to the end of this roughly eight-year post-college program. Uh, I'm personally applying into residency to train on as a physician, and I can tell you more about my career aspirations in a minute, but just to say that people that take this route, some will do 100% uh, research after this kind of training, doing research that may involve you know, interacting with patients um, or, for example, the kind of research you've already heard about uh, with, with leukemias and stuff. Many researchers feel like an MD, if they're doing medical research, is, can, can be pretty valuable, and it certainly is. Um, the other thing I would say, so for me, I think what I'd like to do in the future, I'm applying into a residency in radiology, which is actually looking at imaging, uh, basically of all sorts of areas of the body. I'm particularly interested in neuroimaging. I did my PhD in, in a field called computational neuroscience at the University of Chicago. I studied epilepsy and used sort of computational techniques, supercomputers, math, physics, to try and understand epilepsy. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, what else is there to say? During my PhD, I definitely did a lot of research. I was also very engaged in teaching. I think teaching is pretty important. I uh, wrote a textbook, actually, with a couple of friends. Uh, the textbook is called MATLAB. I know. Well, you, you guys will do it, too. Uh, it's called uh, MATLAB for Neuroscience. It was a textbook that was teaching um, how to use computational techniques to answer questions in neuroscience. Most neurobiologists and biologists in general aren't trained to use uh, computational techniques, but they can be very valuable. And so we wrote a textbook. And in general, um, interested in academic medicine, which basically means interested in trying to balance both the clinical efforts that physicians put in with the research and the teaching that you would find at a, at a university associated hospital like the one we have. So that's me. So I, th I think that's everyone. Um, we have some stock questions we're supposed to address first, or uh, should we go straight to questions in the audience? Straight to audience. Straight to audience. OK. So I think you've heard really a, a strong uh, breadth of experience from people who literally have their hands on patients all day long to those of us who have a mix, to those of us who've taken a completely different approach, like in public policy, to you know, computational biology, where you're, you're at a computer and you're figuring out how very new technologies can be applied to help patients. So hopefully some of us can answer your questions. Anyone? Go ahead. This is mostly a question for Mark, I guess. Um, but I'm. I'm majoring in biology, but I'm also very interested in physics and math. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about how you have used math and physics and some of the less biologically oriented science and, and math um, technologies in your research or in your, um, in your studies and how they relate to biology. Sure. So I'll make a, a sort of brief comment about what I did. I don't want to bore everybody with the technicals, but I'll, but I'll also make a comment about the generality, I think, of application of the physical sciences to, to medicine and biology in general. So I did research um, in epilepsy. The problem with epilepsy is that it's diagnosed by looking at an EEG, right, which is a set of electrodes placed on the brain that measure the electrical activity of the brain. A single EEG electrode measures a, somewhere in the order of millions of neurons uh, at a time, So and it takes about at least a million, if not a hundred million or more neurons to have a coordinated electrical activity to get enough net electrical activity to even be measurable on an EEG electrode that you would put on a person's scalp. And so when you diagnose epilepsy, you're actually looking at the aggregate activity of millions of neurons. And yet when you treat epilepsy with a drug, you actually give a drug that affects a particular ion channel at the molecular level for an individual neuron. And so if you want to understand how epilepsy actually comes about, you have to cross the scale problem from the molecular level all the way up to an aggregate network activity of millions of interacting neurons. 
And that scale problem is a very difficult problem. It's the reason we don't really understand epilepsy even to this day very well. Well, it turns out that anyone who's taken even the basic physics course knows that we have a lot of uh, areas in physics where we can predict the bulk behavior of materials with very simple knowledge of some, like, like everybody remembers PV equals NRT from Gen Chem, right? Even though you have like this beaker full of molecules and they, each molecule has its own bond angles and vibrational energies, rotation, all the stuff going on. Turns out if you just know the volume of the gas, the temperature and some basic stuff, you can calculate you know, the pressure of that entire container. So it turns out that you can apply a lot of the mathematics and physics that were used to develop those kinds of ideas. How do we predict the bulk behavior of something and figure out what are the key features at the molecular level that we really care about when we're talking about it, the bulk behavior and apply that to the brain and ask questions about what are the key features of neurons that we need to know about to really understand how a million or a billion of them would actually interact with each other. And so we used a lot of the same materials, engineering or basic physics, condensed matter, statistical physics, that you could learn you know, in your undergraduate coursework at the University of Chicago to, to look at epilepsy in a novel way. Um, but I will say as a general comment that using the physical sciences, mathematics, ideas from physics, computer science, technology, really can impact every area of medicine. Everything from tumor modeling, if you're interested in tumors, things from dosing and radiation oncology. I mean, there's really nothing, there's really no area of medicine that isn't benefited by being quantitative as opposed to merely quanti qualitative. And, and I think we're at that stage now in medicine where there's a lot of problems that we qualitatively understand well but don't quantitatively yet quite understand. And so there's plenty of room for those kinds of sciences to make an impact in, in biology and medicine. Great. Any other questions? Sure. Can I ask you again on Sure. <laughs> what a gentleman. This is uh That's a good question. That's one that I uh, grappled with after I graduated. So um, as an undergrad, I came here because, like a lot of you, that I really just love learning. And I was more interested in the humanities or in the social sciences. Just I, I don't, It was just what I gravitated towards. Um, I studied a lot of French literature. And then I started taking some international relations classes. And I realized like I, I just kind of cared about helping people. And I wasn't really sure what that meant. And so I was a swimming teacher my first summer after college. And then the second summer, I was like, all right, I better get a, an internship, you know, start to build my resume. And so I went on the internet and found a whole bunch of organizations in New York and Chicago. New York is where my parents live. And um, I just sent, I sent emails to as many as I could find saying, you know, I care about people, human rights, women, healthcare, and sent along my resume, and I got an email back from a woman who worked in New York for an organization that did research on reproductive health, and they did had projects all over the world, and her husband was in the political science department at the U of C, and she said, I caught, you know, your resume caught my eye because you go to the U of C, and my husband Jacob is at the U of C, and we need someone to translate these surveys that we have fielded um, you know, the secretaries can do the data entry, the like ones and the zeros, but we need someone to translate the open-ended questions because they're in French. And she said, would you be interested in working for us this summer and translating these surveys about women's experience with medication abortion in Tunisia? And I said, like, well, sure. And I did that job and I learned all about all of these jobs that you can have where you get to improve healthcare without being a doctor. And I said, you know, I think this is what I want to do. You know, maybe I'll pursue a master's degree in public health. And so that was what led me to think I should move to Washington and work in an advocacy uh, kind of role in women's health afterwards. But then I had this question, you know, do I public health with a focus on policy or public policy with a focus on health? And um, I, think, I don't think there's one right answer. Um, you know, the reason that you choose graduate school, uh, a graduate program, you know, is going to vary for a lot of people and it's going to depend on a lot of things. Mark and I were just talking about where he might do his residency and he said, you know, his family was going to play a big role. And so, you know, there's, it, my reasons aren't going to be the, the best reasons for everyone else, but um, what I realized was that I was interested in really learning about being a public servant and working in government. 
and that I was interested in being around people who also wanted to work in government, not just people who wanted to work on health. And I knew that there would be enough resources um, in, my, in whatever graduate program I went to to focus on healthcare, and it would expose me to lots of other people who were trying to get the same skills that I was, even if they worked on the environment or, um, you know, or on something else. And then the other thing is, um, the program that I chose, the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, which is a school focused on training public servants, is free. <laughs> and when I found that out, that was very compelling. Um, and this is something Cassandra asked, you know, uh, asked us before, you know, if we, if we could touch on is, you know, deciding whether to spend a hundred thousand dollars or more on graduate school is a really big is a really big choice. And so, I found a program that more or less met my needs. Uh, was not going to send me into mountains of debt and would, you know, put me on the road to continue to do what I wanted to do. So I think you brought up two really good points that maybe we could go through um, into each of us. Uh, the first is about family and about this concept of work-life balance, which I, I'm sure all of you have in your mind. I should say um, I hate the term work-life balance because it suggests that your work is not part of your life and you leave your work and go on and live your life in the hours you're not at work and uh, that may be true if you're in one of the other rooms but in this room uh, you're making a decision to join a field where uh, you can help people and it becomes your you know big part of your life but that being said so maybe we could each go through and talk about that. And then the second was about the issue of, of debt, which I do want to get to because uh, it is a different decision for each of you. Um, there are not debtors' prisons out there where people who went to medical school are languishing <laughs> you know, for the rest of their lives. It is a very scary thing to have that much debt, certainly. But uh, maybe you want to talk about your approach um, to work life. Well, my, I, I'll, I'll touch on the, the debt part first okay. um, because that applies to family work life. Um, Chiropractic school, when it's completely funded through government loans. Um, there's no scholarships. You're not going to be the best adjuster out there in the world. And they're going to give you, you know, twenty thousand dollars to a school because you're going to come out and be the best person out there. It's all debt that you're going to take on at the end of school. Um, so you have to really figure out number one. With chiropractic, a little bit different than than allopathic medicine is that you're starting. You're either going out and you're working with a office that's already established. Um, so you're going to want to find somebody who is successful. Um, somebody is going to help you grow and be able to either A, allow you to buy into that practice, uh, which is more debt, and then B, either go off and start your own, give you the good foundation that you're going to be able to be a excellent physician and also a great business person. Because with chiropractic, there's the medical component of it, and then there's definitely a business component of it. And really, uh, most chiropractic schools don't do well teaching you the business component of it. But there are thankfully a lot of uh, practice management groups that are out there that have failed multiple times and they've figured out how to take the failures of lots of chiropractic physicians out there and weed out the failures and figure out what are the right pieces that allow somebody to be successful. Um, which, you know, for, for me, one thing that I get on my Yelp page and my Facebook page, my blog comments, is that it's the doctor-patient relationship. And chiropractic is a little bit different because you're touching people every single time they come in which is a little bit different than what I experienced with allopathic medicine. Being diabetic, I'm seeing a doctor all the time, and I don't get touched ever <laughs> when I go in to see him. Um, so it's a two total different, um, the dichotomy between allopathic medicine and chiropractic medicine, unless you're in doing physical stuff like osteopathic or orthopedic or like PT. Now, on the flip side of that, you have to think, I've got all this debt, so I've got a mortgage before I even have a house. And you have to think, how do I expand upon my life, do I, you know, do I get married? Do I wait until all the debt's gone before I get married? Do I start a family? Um, and then the other component is, whenever my family's in the office, I know that patients are watching how they are. Do, do my kids have scoliosis? You know, because that's gonna be the big thing. I have a huge pediatric patient uh, practice base at my, my clinic. I love, I was, what I was gonna be, if I was going to Pritzker, I was gonna be a pediatrician. Um, I found that if you start younger, and get those little malleable spines better, I don't have to take care of them as long when they're adults and they've screwed up their spines because they've been doing all these bad habits. I can teach them things earlier and get them to think about how they're sitting and standing and you know, 
take care of most of the structural now I'm, problems. Now I'm thinking. Because <laughs> 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 everybody here stops crossing the legs. But that, that's one of the big things. You know, I, I, you know, people say spinal disease, and I, I say, well, it's just spinal neglect. You just don't think about what you're doing on a day-by-day -day basis and how it's affecting what's going on. So the decisions I make to be in the office, because I have to be that businessman, and then come home right when my kids are going to bed, and then get to see them right when they wake up, it's hard. And there's about four or five times during the day that I'll look up on the cork board behind my computer and I see my kids up there. And I'm like, yeah, I could totally be at home watching them play in the backyard or teaching my son who's three and wants to throw everything to throw a ball properly. But I know that what I'm doing now, 10, year, 10 15 years down the line, I'm going to be able to take a couple extra days off during the week to be able to spend that time with the, the family. Right now, it's a lot of going around, around the house, clean up art projects and things that are messy, and I don't really like doing that right now. <laughs> um, so it's a rewarding component that, you know, every time my kids come into the, the practice and I get to adjust them, it instills that, you know, patients know that I believe in what I do and that I do it for my own family. And that's how I treat everybody that comes into my practice is they're like a member of my family and I wouldn't make any recommendations for them that aren't necessary. Um, and so I try to instill that also for those patients to work-life balance because when you have that mom that comes in, you're not just treating her bad, you're treating her husband who can't take care of her because he doesn't know what to do, kids that she has to want to pick up and do all these different things. And so it's how I protect myself versus what I can do with my family and then what I'm doing on a day-by-day -day basis, which allows me to have that you know Saturday or Sunday off to be able to spend time with my kids and give my wife a break. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have great things to say here. Um, I, um, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. Um, right now I'm a resident. I work 80 hours a week, pretty much every, every week, and that's only because the government says that I can't work anymore. Um, when I get out, I will probably work more than 80 hours a week, to be honest. Um, and I went to a private medical school. So um, I'm going to throw out a really scary number, but I walked out of the door of my medical school with $260,000 worth of debt. Um, and that's normal, actually. <laughs> I wasn't buying Prada shoes. Um, when the counselor came and told us, the financial counselor came and told us how much we were going to owe, I looked at my roommate and said, we're getting cable. Because if I'm going to owe $255,000, I might, might as well owe $260,000. <laughs> um, so... It gets you into um, scary situations only because all I would say is make sure that what you're doing is what you love to do. I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't do something that wasn't OB. I know my lifestyle is not going to be pretty. I know I'm single right now and can't take care of a dog. Sometimes I can't get home for 12 hours and it's stuck in the crate. Um, so when I do decide to have children, you know, there's a great likelihood that they'll be raised by a nanny. And that's not, that's not exactly how, when I was, you know, eight years old, I thought that my life would be. But I love my job. Absolutely love my job. Um, and there are days where I'm like, I'm quitting. I hate this. I qu I'm going to quit. You know, you're on your 80th hour of the week or your 87th, but you can't log that because your school will get in trouble. Um, or you had a, a patient with a bad outcome or you had a mom that was tough or you got screamed at by an attending and you're like, I'm going to quit. And I told him I had a bad day the other day and I told my boyfriend, he said, I'm going to quit my job. He said, well, we, we better move to Mexico because I don't know how you think you're going to pay your debt. Um, so once you're in, you're in, you know, you kind of, you become, we talk a lot about being, residents being indentured servants and you kind of are, you know, you told the government that you were going to take out this much and and you are going to pay it back, and you take four years to work a job where you make um, enough to, to live. You know, I pay my car payment, and I pay my apartment payment, but I'm not paying my loans off right now. Um, and then I, I have to put in, you know, at least a good 10, 20 years back into my field before I'm going to break even. Um, so I think when we talk about uh, getting started in the medical, medical profession, um, and committing to going to medical school, I think that's something you really have to think about. Like, is this what I want to do? Even if you take one year of medical school and then decide, I don't like this, I'm going to quit, and you already have, you know, I don't know, $70,000 or with your living expenses plus your, I know the tuition at my school now is up to over 50, I think, a year. Um, now you're a graduate with 
the same undergraduate degree that lots of people are one year of medical school and how much debt. So please make sure that this is what you want to do. I had a lot of friends who I went to um, undergrad with who were pre-med with me um, who were like, dude, I'm only doing this because my dad's a doctor and he really wants me to do this. Don't do it. <laughs> please don't do it. Um, you will be an unhappy physician. Um, you will be stuck in your job. You will have an unhappy family because you're not going to have time to be with them because you have to work. Um, however, on the other hand, if you're like, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm going to love doing, if you're like me and I'm going to work at 7 o'clock tonight after I finish with you guys and I'll get off at 7 p.m. the next day, um, but while I'm there, I'm happy. I really am. I'm tired and I'm cranky and sometimes I yell at nurses. Um, and sometimes I yell at medical students. But um, ob and residents are notoriously... That's what they do. Yeah, notoriously not the most pleasant people. Um, but um, at the end of the day, I go home and I sleep and I wake up the next day and I go to work because I'm happy doing it. So please, um, if you're going to go the medical school route, uh, appreciate the investment. All right, I'll go last if you want to go ahead. Well, I'll just, I'll, one thing I'll say, so I, I talked about my debt issue and um, work-life balance in Washington is a really funny thing because for a lot of people work is life and it's it's kind of cool right I mean it's like being at the UFC like people like to talk about the stuff that happened in their classes they like to talk about what they're reading it's not it's not separate and there are a lot of really passionate people who care about what they do and smart people and so that's really um, that's pretty cool but what I also would encourage you to do is that if there's stuff that in your life that you like doing that's not your work um, not to let go of that my husband worked for Senator McCain for eight years after graduating from college and on his presidential campaign and all that stuff. And like we joke and we say like we gave our 20s to Senator McCain and like all these things that he wanted to do that he loved doing like uh, painting and making beer and all these things he loved doing he couldn't do because he like was like work was all consuming. And then he went to graduate school and he started like taking photography classes and drawing classes. And now we are like reclaiming our 30s. <laughs> and you know, there are times where you don't have a lot of time for hobbies, but um, if you know, to the extent that there's space in your life and there's stuff that you care about, keep doing it. Um, the best thing that happened to me this year is that I became a yoga instructor. And I found a boss who was okay with me taking a couple of Fridays off for several months to, um, to do my training. And now, in addition to teaching congressional staffers about Medicare payment systems, I teach people at a studio how to use their breath and their bodies to feel better. Um, and that's super rewarding. And when you have really bad days at work, <laughs> sometimes you can't change that, but you can create more things in your life that do make you happy. So I would encourage you, um, to the extent that you have hobbies, to um, not forget about them as you move into your careers. Okay. I guess I'll start with the financial part. Um, I should say there are lots of ways to get an MD, PhD. The medical scientist training program, the program that I'm in, is one of the ways. From a financial perspective, it's a great way because they actually pay all of your tuition. So I have no loans for medical school. I have no loans for my PhD. They do actually pay you a stipend on top of that so that you actually have money to live. So from that perspective, the program that I've been involved in has been financially just fantastic. My wife is a pediatrician who traditionally went to med school, did not do a PhD, and did have over $200,000 worth of debt. So as a family, we take that on together, of course. Um, she's paying them back very slowly. She just finished her residency this summer, and she's slowly making payments you know, from whatever we make. Um, from her job mostly, since I get paid a stipend, but it's not a substantial amount. Um, but she's making some payments already towards, you know, towards her loans, and it'll be a long time probably before she's able to pay those loans off, but potentially, you know, when I finish and have a job as well, since I won't be making payments towards my own loans, I can, as a family, will contribute. So hopefully that'll be taken care of, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then to comment a little bit about the sort of family life work balance, yeah, that's a I mean, it's always difficult, but I think if you're passionate about both, then you, you find a way to do both. So as I already mentioned, I'm married. I actually also have a son. He's 16 months old. He was actually born while I was in the middle of my neurosurgery rotation, um, which was a very busy time. I remember like, wake, like being in a hospital, and I couldn't remember if I was at work or if, or if she was delivering. I just didn't know where I was anymore. 
um, you know, and it was sort of like that for the remainder of uh, the third year of medical school. I, I worked not quite 80 hours a week, but most weeks was definitely over 70, pushing the 80 limit. Um, and then I would come home, my wife would be on call, which means that she was going to be spending that night at the hospital. And so even though I had just come from being on call, she was not home, and the baby was waking up every two to three hours and needed to be fed. So there were definitely times where I could think in a month the number of nights I got more than three hours of sleep uninterrupted was, you know, maybe two that month, you know. So that kind of stuff does happen. But when I look back on the year, uh, surprisingly enough, I look back on it actually as an incredibly, uh, incredibly like, I mean, it was a very pleasurable time, actually. It was a wonderful year for me. Um, I loved meeting the patients. I loved how every month I was doing something different and learning something different. I loved watching my son sort of grow up and the way he would like turn and smile the first time and all, all that stuff. I mean, you know, it's hard work, but when you love what you do, you love what you do. It's not really work anymore. Um, so in some ways, you know, this career path will definitely push you in a lot of ways to explore things you maybe haven't tried so far. But if you love what you do, it's incredibly rewarding. And in the end, you're grateful. You're grateful to not sleep. You're grateful to, you know, change your shirt in the morning because you're about to head out the door and someone decided to make a mess of you. Uh, you know, that kind of thing just happens, but it's, it's part of life and, and it's great, actually. Um, so if you, again, I mean, just do what you want to do and if you love what you do, I promise no matter what they throw at you, you're going to be happy with it. Um, and you'll find a way to make it all work. So when I was training, there were no work hour restrictions. And so we did 36 hour shifts all the time, worked well over 100 hours a week, and it was awful and just fantastic. Some of the best times of my life. Um, I've said before, you get reduced to the three primal urges. So sleep, food, and sex are all you care about during that kind of process. Um, but then you come out the other side and um, you know, I did medicine residency, and if, right now the way it works in our country is totally twisted. If you do medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, family practice, something like that, the median salary for people in the U.S. for that kind of work is somewhere in like the hundred sixty to hundred eighty thousand dollars a year range. So not terrible money, but if you do surgical specialties, uh, you know, they they or uh, the median uh, salary for an oncologist in America is five hundred thousand dollars a year. So they back up a Brinks truck to your door and just like dump the money out. Um, and people will make decisions about what kind of special they do because that, that is a lifestyle decision. So if there are you know, major financial issues that, that can eventually motivate some of your decisions, I would really caution you, like everyone else is saying, to, to, to make the decision of the, the job that you really want, what, where you find your, your passion. I think you made an excellent point about um, your children being raised by nanny. So I'm, I'm married. I have a seven-year-old uh, daughter named Sophie and a son named Noah, who's one. And I have the Sophie and Noah rule, which is that I, I live my life based on what I would want for my children's lives. So I work hard. You know, I, I only work probably about 55 to 60 hours a week. And then I do more reading you know, at home and, and things like that uh, on weekends. Uh, and we have an au pair who takes care of Noah during the day. And, but we're always home for dinner by 7. My wife's also a doctor. She's an infectious disease specialist. Um, and when I make decisions, should I go on this trip or should I take on this extra responsibility? I'm on a, a, a presidential council on, uh, on nuclear terrorism, actually. Uh, that takes up a lot of time, and I have to travel for that. Uh, you know, I, I say to myself, well, I have passion about this. And when Sophie is an adult and she has her job and she wants to do this, I, I want her to do it because that's what she wants. I don't want her to feel like she has to be at home with my grandchild. I want her to have her richness in her, in her life. And you know, I know there's a difference between men and women on this. I don't want to sound too old, but I, I can't speak for women, obviously. But I think everyone has to make their own personal decision about how they inspire their children and, and what are the decisions that they make that make them happy uh, and how you can fold that into this, into this work-life balance. So, anyone have any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for all panelists. Uh, if you were to choose, well, if you, if you were to nurture uh, any student here to take your position, uh, like in the job that you do right now, what qualities would you look for in those students? I mean, like, Freaky Friday switch. <laughs> just like that. I mean, just like that. I know a whole bunch of things that I'd look to do when I went back to school. <laughs> no, I mean, are you saying, so what are the personal qualities yeah. of the person who would, who would do well in your position? Really, what I'm asking is, what are the qualities that would be appropriate for, or to carry the functions of your profession? I, I, 
kind of understand where you're going with this. So, um, it, truthfully, uh, you know, as I've alluded to before, chiropractic is a hard, hard science, hard medicine to be in, because you're getting conflict from what people have heard, bad experiences that their friends and family have had, uh, bad experiences they've had. So you have to be that nurturing, educating person to explain what's going on. So first of all, you have to be on top of your research, and you have to be on top of your field. Um, one of the best things about University of Chicago is that if a patient has a question, I usually have it within five minutes because I know how to do research. I, my boss has actually made me the you know, manager of research in our office. We do a lot of um, pro, not, not pro bono, we do a lot of uh, expert witness uh, for our malpractice insurance uh, in our office. And he's always coming to me. He's like, I need to know this test and what it does and all that. And boom, within five minutes, I've got the information for him. So being able to think on your feet because not every person that comes in with a lower back complaint is the same. Um, being able to um, have that ability to be compassionate on a day-by-day -day basis, especially, um, I can speak on the term of treating women, is that and they've told us this in school, is that I am probably going to be the only man that will listen to them as to when they talk about their complaints. Um, and so being able to be there and be the ear, and this is, this is true, is you, I, I'd say on a, on a weekly basis, I have about five women crying in my office because they don't have the compassion at home, whether it be relationship or parents or anybody to listen to what suffering they're going through. And having a psych degree from the University of Chicago, I really get there as to what is the driving force to get a person into the office. And so being able to dig for that person to know what their health goal is as to why they're in your office would be the biggest character I would recommend or would look for to have somebody sit in my chair for a day while I go and make beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work with medical students every day, so people who are just one step kind of right above you. So I have, um, I have medical students that I love and I have medical students that I do not love. And for me, in my position, um, I'm a gynecologist um, an obstetrician, so it's people skills, people skills, people skills. I don't care if you can recite the Krebs cycle, I can't um, anymore, but I don't care what kind of knowledge you have. Um, I need you to be able to interact with people, because I walk in, seriously, when I'm on the floor, somebody comes in, they've never met me before. I walk in, I say, hey, I'm Dr. Schriefer, I'm gonna check your cervix. And that means I'm going to put on a glove and I'm going to put it in a place that you don't let anybody put their hand. So it's like instant rapport. Immediately, you have to be able to read people. You have to be able to see, you know, and that's different on the south side of Chicago. I have 16-year-old girls come in and it's always like, girl, what is up? My name is Dr. Schriefer. I'm here. And then you go to the north side of Chicago and it's very like, I'm Dr. Schriefer. I'm a, third, I'm a senior resident. I'm here to help you today. I've already spoken with your physician. So you have to be able to adapt very quickly. I know, it's a funny job. Um, adapt very quickly and have um, a way of making people comfortable. The other thing is I like students who have initiative. I don't want to tell you four times I've had students stand at the door and I'm like, go meet the patient, say hi, find out what they're here for and come back and tell me. The patient in that room. Yeah, the patient in that room. You want me to say hi? Yeah, I want you to say hi. To the patient. Yes, to the patient. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you are able to deal with people, I think medicine is more, in my field, more customer service than anything else. If you're able to deal with people and have um, the initiative to get things done on your own, you'll pick everything else up. You'll be able to learn everything else. So I wrote down a, whole, a number of different things, uh, ambition, curiosity, skepticism, creativity, intellect, and then attention to detail. I think all those things apply really well to a, a good scientist, someone who, you, you have to maintain curiosity. You just have to constantly be curious about things. I think Wikipedia is the most wonderful thing because uh, you know, you can hear any, there can be a question in your conversation and no one knows the answer to it and I just love to go on Wikipedia and figure out what the answer is. And I probably forget it within a nanosecond after I've looked it up, but uh, it's such like a surge of, of pleasure to actually get the answer and then, and then know it. Um, for clinical medicine, I totally agree. I think people skills uh, and compassion are, are absolutely essential. You know, I, I walk into a room and say, I'm Dr. Weinstock, uh, and I'm sorry you have leukemia, and we're going to have to, you know, the, the rest of your life is going to be different than you thought it was, and we're going to have to deal with this together. Uh, and if you can't establish a rapport with your patients and their families uh, from the beginning and then maintain that, then you're not going to have a productive 
productive relationship. Um, but a big part of being a good doctor is not just that. It's also always wanting to be better at what you're doing. So um, I know I'm giving a long-winded answer, but I think ultimately this comes down to the, the, a, a certain amount of humility, like a confidence in who you are, the ability to really know that, that when you're an intern, you're not a good doctor. When you're a resident, you're still not a very good doctor. And it's called practice because that's what you do your whole career. You just practice to get better at being whatever kind of practitioner you are. I would say a lot of those things apply to work uh, in government and in public policy. Um, the two things that I like best in the people that work for me and the people that I work with are people who, when they have an interaction, we have, because we're a commission and we advise the Congress, we sort of have a, um, a kind of a client relationship with them. And staffers call us up because they are confused about something or their boss needs something and they ask us questions. And the most important question you can ask yourself is why is this person asking me this question? Because, you know, and, it, and it's the same thing, you know, someone comes in, they say, my stomach hurts. You can't just, you know, just treat the stomach. You know, there's lots of other, you know, things. Um, and so asking the question of, you know, why is this person asking me this question? Why are we in this situation? What is going on in the environment? What's happening in the newspaper? What's happening in the, um, you know, at the White House? What's happening in, you know, in the stock market? You know, what, what's going on that's causing this person to call me on the phone? And then, and then the other thing is the, and, and what else are they going to need? Um, you know, if I, if someone calls me and asks me a very specific question and I give them just that very specific answer, they don't go off, you know, they don't go off that much better than they came to me. And um, the healthcare system is complicated and um, policymakers, especially lawmakers on Capitol Hill are extremely busy and they have to be responsible for healthcare, which is complicated, and everything else, which is also complicated. And um, being able to anticipate, you know, what a staffer will need to help their boss really understand an issue, to make an informed vote about something, um, really requires kind of that breadth of thinking. Why are they calling me? And the forethought, what are they going to need next? And I think that's helpful in government work and it's probably helpful in any other path that you take. So being last actually after everyone's already had a really good description of what they would look for, it's hard to add to that, but I guess a few things I would say. Um, you know, you're all from U of C, the, the intelligence part of becoming a doctor, you guys already all have it. That's why no one's focusing on it. I mean, of course you need to be able to learn and study and be a lifelong learner because medicine changes all the time, but you guys are okay with that. I think the comment about being good with people, you know, is a really, really important one. The other one that was mentioned also briefly, the, the humility, you know? I mean, give you an example, you know, doing my PhD, finishing up in 2010, there were periods of time where I was you know, going and giving lectures or conferences uh, to people about my research in you know, sort of a niche area. It's what you do in a PhD, you carve out some small area that you can sort of become the expert in. And I literally went from giving lectures in front of a bunch of people on some, you know, topic that was of my particular interest, uh, to doing digital rectal exams and tracking prostates, right? Putting on a pair of gloves and telling the guy to, you know, bend over. Um, why? Because it's his health, right? It's not about me. It's not about a thought about, oh, well, you know, I was giving a lecture about something and, you know, no. It's not about that, right? It's about, you want to be a doctor because you want, it's about healthcare. It's about making people, you know, keeping them healthy and when there's something wrong, figuring it out. And so take all the brilliance that all of you guys have and realize why you have it and what it's for. It's a gift. It's not something to have to turn to someone and say, look what I've got. You know, it's, it's nothing to do with that at all. Take your brilliance, you know, that got you this far, and always remember that it's a responsibility that you're this smart. Not that you have to spend every waking moment, you know, but you weren't given this gift to, for it to be wasted. Use it, and always remember that you have it for the goal of doing something to benefit others with, you know? And if you keep that in mind, and, and you constantly strive for that, then I think you could, yeah, you could replace me today, probably. Um, that, that's the key. Uh, so it's becoming increasingly more common to take a gap year between college and uh, medical school and PhD. Uh, uh, obviously, it's a very personal choice what you do with that year. I was wondering, for each of you, uh, what did you do if you took one, or what do you think the most uh, interesting thing you could do with that year? 
I took a gap year. I didn't know there was a term for it. <laughs> um, I thought I was just taking a year off. Um, I took a I took a year off um, because, and I talked a little bit this at lunch with some of the girls who were at my table, but um, I took a year off because I was applying and my application was done and my essays were written. And um, I was so exhausted. I was working 35 hours a week during undergrad and I was busy and I was directing a dance show and, and I um, slept through an MCAT practice exam. Mark and I were actually in the same MCAT prep uh, course. I slept through an exam and I lost it. I just lost it. You know, I like emotionally and mentally lost it. And I remember I was sitting in, I ran the coffee shop on the second floor of the Reynolds Club and I was like head on the countertop crying, lost it. And um, I pulled it together and I went into Cassie's office and I read my essays and they were bitter. <laughs> they were really bitter. My essays were like, I can't believe we have to go through all this. I can't believe I had to take organic chemistry. You know, <laughs> that's what my essays were. And I was like, oh my goodness, like I can't. I can't submit these because um, I'm not in, I wasn't in um, the right place to apply to medical school. I kind of lost focus of what I wanted to do. So um, we talked about it and I decided I was going to take a year off. Um, and that sounds very um, luxurious to take a year off, you know? Travel, go to Africa. No, I'm from middle class parents and I had student loans. So um, I worked. because. I mean, what are you going to do? If you can find somebody to pay for you to travel to Africa, that would be awesome, I think. I think that would be a great year. Um, I had already done, uh, my, I had done some research. Um, I had the opportunity to work at the Brookfield Zoo with children, which is the best job I ever had, period. I did imagination play for an entire summer. Um, I pretended to be a lemur and jumped around in costumes and made crafts, and it was very therapeutic. Uh, for my soul, I think. Um, so that was my therapy, and then I had to buckle down. I actually worked for a law firm, and I wrote contracts for adoptions, gestational surrogacies, and um, egg donations. Um, because it was, I actually got it through a, another alum, another friend of mine had worked for her. She's like, hey, I'm leaving, I'm going back to grad school, do you wanna do this job? Yeah, because I'm not ready to go to med school and I need a job. Um, so take a year off and do anything if you're not ready. Because like I said before, if, if you're not just not sure, a year of your life, I think, is a small price to pay against doing something that you're not um, emotionally ready to do. The first year of medical school, I started um, with some people who had just finished college, and they came in burned out. Um, and I came in after sitting and staring at a computer for a year, and I was like, let's go. I'm so ready. So I think it all depends on where you are mentally and physically, what you can afford to do. I would have loved to do something awesome, but all I could afford was to work at a law firm. Um, and um, if, you, if you're like, no, I'm ready to go to med school right now, go to med school, save a year of your life. But if, you wanna, if you're not there, then do whatever you can for a year until you're there. Two years, three years. I actually have friends, the best people in med school, I thought, were the people who did like a totally different career for a while. They were like the most interesting people. They had the most perspective. Um, I had friends who were in the Peace Corps for two years and came back. They had the best stories. They were the most mature. Um, I had people who, who worked in the health field. I, I had a medical student who um, worked in pharmaceuticals. Um, and I got to be there the first time that she saw. She made um, a material that um, induces coagulation for people who are bleeding heavily in the OR. And I looked over it one day and she's like crying when we were in the OR. And I was like, what are you going, what are, what's going on? And she's like, I spent five years of my life making this product, period. I know where the plastic comes from. I know where everything comes from. She's like, I saw, I've seen videos I've never seen in practice. So you can change later. You can always come back and do medicine. Medical schools aren't really going anywhere. We'll always be here. Yeah, so the, the median age for first year medical students is 26. Um, I think it's a very personal decision. I did not take a gap year. I went straight into medical school solely because I got into medical school, um, like off the wait list three weeks before it started. Um, and at the time I was you know, teaching Princeton Review MCAT course 12 hours a week, drinking a lot of beer and living in a fraternity house with no plans for what I was going to do <laughs> during, during, during the gap year, should I have a gap year. Um, so it's funny how things could have been different, right? Uh, I, you know, I, on the other hand, there's a, uh, a U of C graduate from the class of 2010 who's now a technician in my laboratory, uh, Liat Bird, 
who is just a superstar. And she left college, you know, clearly with an outstanding application for medical school, but working in the lab for two years, she's now on two manuscripts and two more coming out, and she has letters from me and other people at Harvard, and it has just kicked her application up another notch. Um, so I think if you're interested in science, that's always an opportunity. I would, I don't give advice, but I would consider the possibility of taking at least two years if you're gonna do that, because I really think it's hard to accomplish something in a year in a, in a laboratory setting. I think the Peace Corps is great, I think consulting is great, I think whatever, um, but I also think if your personal decision is to go straight to medical school like I did, I don't regret that a bit. Um, it could be a very long course, uh, and so you know, getting into it can be the right decision. If you're not sure exactly what you want to do, one year isn't enough. I mean, it's one thing if you know you want to go to medical school and you know you just need a little break, but um, if you uh, come out of college and say, I'm not sure what I want to do, I'll take a year, you actually have to know that fall, once you finish, what you're going to do, because that's when the you know that's when you have to do applications for everything, get your re recommendations, and so um, I I said I'm going to take a year, and that it turned into three years, and I thought that I was going to be the oldest person in my grad school class, and I was among the youngest, um, so it's I was telling someone at the lunch table the most amazing thing about being in the working world is Sunday <laughs> because there's no dread <laughs> at all. Maybe, maybe you're dead going back to work, but you don't get to that point Sunday afternoon and you're like, oh shit, that problem set. There's none of that. It's beautiful. You can take a nap. <laughs> you can go to the movies. You can host a dinner party. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. So I would um, incur, I, I, you know, I really enjoyed the time that I took. When I ended up back at graduate school, I was much more focused. I was much, you know, like even, I mean, my master's program was just two years, which I thought was going to be a long time, and it went by in a flash. And so you kind of have to know where you want to be when you finish, when you start. Um, so I, I, I definitely benefited uh, from that time, and you know I moved to DC and worked for a nonprofit. Um, I worked for a group that focused on uh, women's reproductive health in DC, and my roommate from U of C, she worked on women's reproductive health in the field in Mexico, and we would email each other, and she was definitely having more fun than I was, <laughs> um, because she was like actually getting to meet you know, the women who were benefiting from the services, from the organization she provided, and she was like at the beach and making crafts, and it was good. So, um, again, you know, everyone has their constraints for what they can do, but there's a lot of different options. Um, yeah, I would say for me, since I, I knew I was gonna be doing an MD-PhD program, which was already kind of eight years plus, I didn't know what residency, now it turns out that it's gonna be an extra good five or six by the time I finish residency training. So for me, I think taking another year off was sort of a bad idea if I could avoid it. And I was a little tired, but I, I thought I could handle it, and so I just went straight. Um, my wife also went straight from, from college, from U of C when she graduated, to medical school. But I think I've known a lot of people over the years who have taken a year off between. And people do it for different reasons. Certainly if you're not ready or you're unsure if it's what you want to do, you have to take some time off. There's a group of people I've, I've met along the way who have taken a little bit of time off to bolster their application which is perfectly reasonable if you fall into that category. Um, I kind of agree with the comment about taking a little more than a year if you're going to bolster it by doing research because I forgot the name of the law, but there's this law that says, you know, things take twice as long as you think they will take even when you take this law into account. And that's kind of the way it is in research. You may think you know exactly <laughs> what's going to happen, but it takes at least double what you think it will, even if you keep this in mind. So um, if you're going that route, I agree. Give yourself a little bit of extra time. You'll feel better about it. It won't freak you out if if you know you're on a tight budget. I skipped you, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, I'm gonna talk to the other half of the room that are might be wired like I am, that you can't sit and not do anything. Um, when I was graduating, I applied to one chiropractic school because I knew I needed to stay close to home because of my mom's health. Um, so I applied to National College of Chiropractic out in Lombard. It was my fourth year, it's about six months uh, before the end of school, actually about eight months before the end of school, I got my acceptance. I was told that the class and two classes were full, and I'd have to wait eight months to get into chiropractic school. I'm like, all right, great. What am I going to do for eight months? Because um, I always have to do. Well, my last four months of school, I had finished all my course hours, so I was working at three different libraries and dri driving the drunk van. 
uh, for four months while I was at UFC. Nice. Yeah. So my last night at the drunk bag, I had, uh, Is that where I recognize you from? <laughs> so, you know, I was doing everything I could. So I'd go from 7 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning and get three hours of sleep just to prepare me for those nights that my children wanted to cry a lot. So um, while I was walking through the quads, I saw this woman stumbling around this circle that's not there anymore. Um, at, 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 um, with this spine on her suitcase and um, she's like looking at paperwork and I'm like are you lost and she's like yeah I'm from the National College of Chiropractic and I need to find the biocide building I, I'm 15 minutes late to a presentation for students um, and I'm like ooh fortuitous so <laughs> I'm like Light bulb. I know exactly where the biocide building and so I, I'm walking her over there and I was like actually I'm I accepted the program, so I'm not going to be coming to watch what you have to say. Um, but you know, the unfortunate thing is I have to wait eight months to get in there. I was like, we're really hoping to get in sooner rather than later. And so we, we chit-chat, we talk about different things. I was telling her about how to be careful because nobody at the University of Chicago wants to walk around the clouds, looks up, so you might bump into people. So you know, the big thing is that I got a call three weeks later and said, we have a space for you that opened up. So I literally had four months off to work summer job to get some money to pay for beer when I was in chiropractic school um, <laughs> to, um, to there, and then I was like is ramped up and then I got to National College of Chiropractic and they give you two options you can between your first and second your third and fourth and your fifth and sixth you can take a summer off between those trimesters and then when you get into your clinic rounds they don't want you taking time off or you can go all year round and so I took a five year program turned into three years four months so Literally, I turned 26, and two days later, I got my doctorate. A week later, I was working in my practice. So I'm, I'm the type of person that can't sit and do anything I have to do. Um, and so for those of you that are ambitious and don't like to sleep and um, really want to get started right away, I would encourage you to do that. My main fear was coming from the University of Chicago, going into a medicine-based program, if I took time off, I would lose that that creative drive, that wanting to learn drive that the University of Chicago gave me. And that I would just kind of be like, yeah, I'll go ahead, I'll do something else. You know, you know, that's how it was towards the end of the University of Chicago. It's like, I've spent four months working three jobs and I'm like, well, I can go out and I can work three jobs someplace else, make some money, do some stuff. You know, I luckily got out of the University of Chicago with a, you know, a little bit of uh, owing for, for college, not as much as most people leave, but, um, <laughs> I really wanted to go, and I wanted to start helping people right away, and so it's just like, just go, 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 go. And my mom was like, stop. You need to take a break. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I can help you. <laughs> you know? So that was the big thing. So I, I think that is a really important point. There are people who get lost. Uh, so if your plan is to take time off and, quote, do some stuff, uh, then that's probably not a good idea, uh, and you may want to really rethink that plan either to go directly to whatever program you're thinking about eventually or really to come up with something that's meaningful and creative for you. So, any other questions? Yeah. You can just talk about that. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for uh, you, uh, Dr. Weinstock. Um, as a physician that uh, does a lot of research, uh, I see that you can get your PhD. Um, can you talk about why you felt that, um, why you felt that So, I mean, I think based on my story about how I got into medical school, it's pretty obvious I couldn't get into an MD-PhD program. But, uh, I, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> um, no, so, uh, it's true, but it's also true that at that point I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I was so jazzed about just uh, being a doctor. Um, and then during medical school, I realized I liked internal medicine more than surgery. During early in internal medicine, I recognized I really liked oncology. Uh, and then during oncology training, I really saw that the people who were my role models could do it all. They could do bench research and they could do clinical. Um, and so I made this commitment, which required a lot of humility, I think similar to what other people were talking about, um, to then go back into the lab. So uh, I went from being a completely trained doctor, now six years out from medical school, my colleagues were going on starting practices or joining academic groups, giving national talks and so on. And I was like, first day in the lab, didn't know how to make the LB broth. The high school, literally the high school student was teaching me how to do stuff. My first, my first week, 
you know, they had like these huge four liter flasks with that you make the LB broth in. And uh, there was a stir bar in the bottom, and I dropped the powder in for the LB broth. And I'm sort of, and I'm still dressed like a doctor because I don't know, but maybe my second day. Um, and so I'm dressed like a doctor, and I'm stirring around this thing, and the stir bar crashes through the glass, and four liters of this stuff is just like all over me. <laughs> and uh, and I have this moment when I'm thinking like I could just I'm out, like uh, I'm going back to medicine. Never mind. Um, so, but I didn't, and I stayed on, and I just love it. It's the it, real passion. Um, so it just kind of unfolded that way. You can be an MD and be a, a physician scientist like me. As you can see, Harold Varmus, who's the head of the National Cancer Institute and a Nobel Prize winner, is a straight MD. There are many other examples. Um, but it you know, requires focus at a certain time in your career. And if you have mountains of debt and you have family and you can't move wherever you'd like, and whatever, all those things, like life gets complicated. Uh, and so if that's what you know you want to do, then the best chance for actually getting there is to focus at the beginning and do them both. Uh, so you take a little bit of risk, I think, by saying, well, I'll just push all the science stuff to the end. Yeah. Um, uh, some of you guys already touched on this question, but um, in each of your respective fields, could you elaborate a little on the interaction that you have with other industries that impact healthcare, like law, policy, or social care? And then, do you have any advice, or could you tell us a little about a little bit about the opportunities that you took um, in undergrad that you wish you took um, that would help you become more knowledgeable or gain exposure in those areas? Sure. Well, um, the really neat thing about my job is that every single day I get to interact with people who um, are in different fields and have different skill sets than I do. So every day there are drug companies, medical device companies, patient groups, physicians, hospital administrators, health plan, um, people who run health plans, actuaries, economists, um, uh, politicians. I mean, all these people are coming through our door or calling us up every day. And so it really keeps you um, honest and aware of sort of like what's at the core of the issues and um, helps you stay honest about um, how you talk about things. You know, in DC we use a lot of jargon. And if you have all these people in different fields who use different um, acronyms, it can get a little bit um, a little bit complicated sometimes. Like, um, I, when I started at the Medicare program, I knew that we were dealing with managed care plans. And a type of managed care plan is a PPO, a preferred provider organization. And um, my boss, she, kept writing PPO on all these things, and I was like, I don't really understand how that fits. And what she meant was, please print out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, it, you know, so it's, so it's really, you know, it's really fun. And, you know, and so um, I'm kind of like in a cadre of people who are like creative policy thinkers, and um, we have to work with lawyers who know what the law is. And often, you know, there's some negotiating about what we can actually do in the, um, in the context of what's legal. Um, but that's why you have the Congress. They change the laws. Um, so I, I, that's what I think is cool about being in policy is that um, it's, it's not just government workers. It's people with lots of different skill sets and who have, you know, who have um, expertise in lots of different areas. And um, I saw a briefing a few years ago with Paul Farmer. Um, the physician who founded the organization Partners in Health, who do amazing work all around the world. And the message he was trying to get across in the briefing was that um, we don't think strategically enough about the way that we deploy our different kinds of aid. So the um, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, gave all this money to, um, to send antiretrovirals you know, all over the world, Africa in particular. Um, but that, that money, those funds weren't coordinated with the funds that go for food aid. And um, if you give people just the drugs, but they don't have any food to eat when they take the drugs, they can't digest them well, and then the drugs don't work. And so it really does remind you how important it is to, um, you know, to think about healthcare in a, in a broader context. And um, I sat next to a really cool chick at lunch, Kavya, and she was telling me about this group called Health Leads that she works with here in Chicago that does a similar, a similar thing. So. Um, you know, thinks about all the different, you know, the different needs that that you can help address with people that will help improve their health. So, um, I think that's probably enough for me. So I have a pretty broad um, 
I think, uh, experience. So we deal with the NIH for funding. We deal with organizations like the American Cancer Society, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, which are advocacy groups that range from you know people literally walking around with cans collecting pennies up to up to billion dollar donors. Uh, I deal with Department of Health and Human Services on some of the the nuclear terrorism stuff. I have a relationship with a drug company where uh, they provide some funding for my laboratory, and I do studies on their on their uh, some of their compounds. And that's, that, that's very productive and a totally different experience to deal with drug companies. Um, and then we do some advocacy, for example, through the American Society of Hematology to try to uh, lobby, basically, and get uh, federal funding, both through the NIH and then more, more directed funding. And that's really fun to go to Capitol Hill. It's completely infuriating, though, <laughs> uh, because you're dealing with people who have almost no time to deal with you and know nothing about what you're talking about, which you think is the most important thing in the world, and then seem to make these very kind of capricious decisions or politically motivated ones. Um, and so trying to kind of subsume my own feelings about that and, and have more productive conversations about, about how to actually, why this is important, why your constituents would think this important, why people would actually be happy that you're supporting this has been you know, a really educational process for me because the other part of your question was like, what at the UFC did we learn? You know, so a lot of the stuff you just learn on the fly, right? I mean, uh, if you know your Kant and Hegel, you know, it provides a good foundation for kind of the way humans interact, sure. But actually learning how to do these things, how to manage a budget, how to deal with a company, how to deal with the government, and so on, you, you just gotta, you gotta. It's the same curiosity. It's learning on the fly. Any other questions? That's a good question. What, what can you do when the politics change <coughs> maybe every four years? And, and there are people who believe one way, and there are people who believe the other way. And when they're in control, everything goes to have on a higher, you know, card. And then, and then you know, how, how does that make you feel about what, you're, what is achievable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I finished graduate school, I, um, I went to work for, for the administration um, at, the, at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And a number of my friends um, didn't want to do that same fellowship program that I did because they didn't want to work for the Bush administration. And I sort of said, like, well, maybe it's not my politics, but there's got, I mean, most of the people who work in these agencies are, public, are civil servants. They're not political appointees, of course, you know, at the tops of the agencies you have those. And one thing that I was really struck by and, and really humbled by was just how um, smart and dedicated the, um, the civil servants are and how much good was being done every single day for Medicare beneficiaries. And even though um, things can change on the margins in, pre in ways that seem really radical, um, you know, the, the, the differences from one administration to another aren't actually as big as as, as they seem when you know people talk them about them in political fights and so that gave me some hope that you know no matter who's in power um, you know we have this checks and balances um, there are federal employees who are working to make sure that these programs work for beneficiaries and for taxpayers in the long run and then the th second thing I'll say is one of the best things that I have one of the best experiences I, I've had at my current job was actually being involved in the um, kind of how a bill becomes a law from beginning to end so when I first got to MedPAC, um, was in the planning stages of the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, the health reform legislation. And so we spent a lot of time with the staff talking about different policy options, trying to help them design um, ideas, because it's not the members of Congress who write the laws, <laughs> just so you know. Um, it's their staff, really smart, skilled people. And, um, and so we spent probably, 16 months helping them to draft, you know, what I thought was good policy, informed by data, 
you know, reflecting consensus in, you know, at least in the, you know, health services research and the medical sciences. And, um, and then you get to a point when the members become involved and the horse trading begins where people like me weren't really in the room, right? And that's where kind of deals get made, things get thrown out, things get put in. And that can be really frustrating. And so um, I have learned after working in Washington for almost 10 years that you, ha you have to, you know, define success in different ways. <laughs> um, you have to understand that, you know, when, when you have a loss somewhere, it's not a loss forever. You know, things can always change. And it's the thing that has inspired me to keep working in the government, to keep showing up every day and trying to do the best that I can for Medicare beneficiaries, for healthcare providers to bring them to the table so that they'll continue to serve Medicare beneficiaries. And most profoundly, like for all of us, you know, every one of our paychecks, when you look at, you know, the Medicare taxes that come out, I mean, these are our dollars. And the more that Medicare costs, the less money we can spend on other priorities that we have, and it's growing. And you know, we have there's a trust fund, but then anything that the trust fund can't pay for gets paid for out of general revenues, and that pool is getting smaller and smaller. And so, I I've had sort of like this you know civic commitment revival in the last couple of years, like this really strong sense that like smart people have to show up every day and do this work, and it can be frustrating. But if you, if you quit and you don't do it then, you know, you're just leaving it to the, the political hacks. Cool. Next question. Yeah. Are there any undergraduate classes that you would recommend, if you remember, that were, like, really special or important for you in determining your career, or any advice you give to undergraduate students trying to, like, decide if they go to school? And yeah. I guess maybe being sort of tied for the closest person to still being in, and actually still a current student at, at University of Chicago, I can comment. Um, particular class, I'd have a hard time honestly saying that there is one that you just must take if you're going to go into the medical profession. But I had a discussion at the table about how important I thought studying abroad was actually for me when I was in at University of Chicago. We've talked a lot about the commitment that you make when you go into the healthcare profession. And so you should take a minute and realize the freedoms that you have as an undergraduate student now before you go into medicine. Um, it's, it can be a very busy schedule once you're there. And so right now, you actually, you guys have an, an amazing opportunity. You've got a whole campus full of people that will teach you just about anything. Whether or not you need it in your future job, doesn't. it's not even a question, who cares? The point is that you can go out there and find a random course in a foreign language, or even better, go find a random country you know, and go and see what it has to offer, you know? And I think that because you're all going to be, you know, very successful, you're all going to be professionals down the line, you actually have a sort of unique opportunity now that some of us maybe who didn't get a chance to do some of those things would have, you know, would love to do differently. Um, I, I think it was, you know, studying abroad is one of the best things I ever did. And certainly there are times when I'm up at 3 o'clock in the morning and a patient's not doing well and I'm exhausted and I'm like, God, remember that day when I just got up, grabbed a loaf of bread in Paris, strolled down the Champs-Élysées? I mean, you know, it doesn't happen very much. So, you know, that was one thing I think that if you can do, even if it means, you know, not taking some fancy course that may, I don't know, boost your GPA a fraction of a point more than, I mean, another, so what? Just do, I would do that if you can. I mean, I was saying earlier, we're, this is medicine. We're all more than just scientists. We're actually all people too. And it, it's nice to, to be a well-rounded person and have seen a lot and done a lot. I mean, your patients come from all over and sometimes you can interact with them in unexpected ways. So I would do that. It's a recommendation. Definitely study abroad. Get out of town. You're not going. <laughs> you will not. Re I I had anxiety that I would miss out. I went to Paris also for a whole year, and I was like concerned about all the opportunity I was I would miss out on. And when I got back, except for the fact that they built a dorm behind the reg while I was gone, <laughs> everything was exactly the same. And um, it was it was the the best choice I made in college. Yeah. My mom wouldn't let me study abroad. But, uh. <laughs> I, didn't, I couldn't study abroad. I was on the science tracks that you guys are on. Um, so what I would say is um, I did a human, human development major. You have enough time. Take classes that you like, whether they're in uh, theater or something else. Do something fun because after this, there are no electives in medical school, not in my medical school. And if they were, they were like pharmacy classes. You know, it's nothing that you wanted to do, and um, <laughs> unless you're my boyfriend and a pharmacist. Um, so 
take soak up everything you can. I um, talk all my friends know how much I valued my education at the University of Chicago because it was broad, because I can talk about things. You will never know when it's going to help you to be able to quote some uh, something you read in a social class at a bar at midnight to pick up some guy. So you don't know. <laughs> it's serious. People are like, did you just quote Tina Fey and then Sigmund Freud? And I'm like, yeah. I can do that. That's why you should date me. So um, it might it might it might help with patients. It might not, but it'll make you a better rounded person. You won't have the chance to do it again. Um, how it falls into chiropractic? Chiropractic is currently split between two two different things. There's the philosophical and there's the mixers. The mixers are the ones that think more like medical doctors, like myself, and the philosophical are the ones that went to Palmer and Iowa, where the first school was, where. You think that there's this energy that helps the body heal that's floating above the earth, and those people are crazy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the great thing about the University of Chicago is that you're forced in the core to take philosophy or social science or civ classes that you're, you know you're like African civ or development of the nuclear weapon. I, mean, I don't even know. I'm most displaced from the Common Core, the graduating being the the oldest graduate up here. I don't even know. There's a whole bunch of new buildings. They put a Fabergé egg next to the Regenstein. I just know what's going on. You know, I come back to school, it's all glimmering and happy. When I toured, it was gray and dark and rainy and all the gargoyles are looking at me going, come here. <laughs> so, you know, whatever you can, whatever you can grab. I'm, I mean, my last year, I took four graduate course, you know, levels. And, you know, the, funny, the funniest story I have is that one of my TAs from the graduate course was actually the female model for our pelvic exam course, and she's like going on about how the graduate school is so much better than the current core at the University of Chicago. And I'm like, yeah, especially in class like, you know, 462, and I, I'm, I'm touching her cervix. <laughs> and she just goes, I do recognize you. <laughs> and I was like, everything checks out just fine. <laughs> so yes. Everything is healthy and normal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've got to be careful. So, I mean, it's, um, it's the main thing is that you get uh, such a wide variety of classes. Um, I took stuff that I don't use at all. Um, but at the same time, I got, I, my hobby is I brew beer and I love the chemistry and the biology of it. But I was quoting Adam Smith Wealth of Nations to a couple of guys in my garage on Monday talking about the hands-on component of building a chair and how it's all specific and that, uh, you know, our current uh, economic model, because Adam Smith was firing against this, is very bad. It doesn't allow for quality of care. It's like, nobody touch my beer. It's mine. I'm going to do all the steps. And so, and they're like, what? <laughs> do you have something else to open? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's being able to have that and kind of see who is following your conversation and who's not. And you can kind of like, all right, I'm going to give that guy another beer. Or I'm going to take that person out, and I'm going to introduce them to my other friends who went to the University of Chicago. I know that. And it's, it's just kind of cool, you know, be able to see that difference. So take whatever you want. It doesn't matter once you get into med school. They're going to tell you what you have to take. That's the big thing about so, it. So basically, I think the answer is whatever will get you some action in a bar. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> um, no, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, the last thing I'll say is we all are here because we care. So if we have anything that we could possibly contribute to you, please email us. So thank you all. And Thank you.